Belated Eid Mubarak to our viewers, and I hope you've had a wonderful time. Time seems to fly. Dissecting and digesting the Prime Minister's speech that took place in Birmingham on Monday with reference to radicalization, how to make our communities safe. The Prime Minister spoke at a school and he talked about British values. Is it just about British values that would make our country secure? We're in for an interesting dis discussion, two young people who know their subject matter. Let's welcome them, shall we? Assalamu alaikum, Jangir bhai. Wa alaikum, salam. A very happy Eid, belated Eid Mubarak. Belated Eid Mubarak. Did you have a good Eid? Eid? I did. Good, uh, good. Way. Didn't you go fast? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Don't it's like, like yesterday that we were looking at Ramadan? And yes, it seems. Uh, I know. It yes. seems uh, some time ago now. Absolutely. And of course, um, Raza. Assalamu alaikum, Raza. Raza well, Nadeem. Um, is this the first time? I hope it will not be the last time. Oh, I sincerely hope so as well. So it's good to have you here. Yeah. We will discuss, um, we will come back to you and we'll talk about your very uh, famous leader, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jangi Bhai, just help me to understand the speech. Just take me through, just, you know, to explain what was the speech about. I mean, his opening line was very much about uh, communities <coughs> living with the British values, how we're going to, if I, if I, if I can just use the words, um, your inspiring teachers and commitment to British values means you are just achieving outstanding academic success, but you are also building a shared community. I don't find anything wrong with that. Um, let's put it into context. Mm. I think, uh, you know, um, we just before uh, Cameron came back to power, we had the counter-terrorism and security uh, bill uh, and act. And as soon as the Tories got uh, re-elected, they announced new legislation that they're proposing mm -hmm. called the Counter-Extremism Bill. And uh, in the build-up, he was basically saying that uh, this is a generational conflict. This is the, the, the uh, conflict or struggle of our generation. So there's a big build-up. Uh, and he was uh, building it up. And essentially, uh, on Monday, he was justifying what he's about to do mm. uh, and uh, it wasn't so much a speech it was more like a political sermon yes 5,564 words you can't uh, you know uh, a bit like a Pakistani politician which which might uh, give you some indication that some Pakistanis had a bit of an input into it <laughs> how uh, very interesting um, <laughs> but uh, you know this speech is nothing new no it's not uh, mm. I want to ask all your viewers and yourself to Google something when you go, mm -hmm. go home tonight. Check out something called the Green Peril. In Green the Peril. 1990s, uh. Reagan and people started this whole idea mm -hmm. that um, the Muslim world was struggling for independence mm -hmm. and self-determination. And to justify their intervention and their wars in the Muslim world, they came up we have to create a new threat, mm -hmm. the green threat, to replace the red threat of communism. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that was an ideological struggle. Uh. So overseas, they, uh, it was about showing all these Muslim states that are becoming independent or struggling to become independent are enemies. Now, in the last two decades, three decades, what they've done, they've now taken that concept of the green peril an ideological struggle between Islam and uh, Western ideology and said now there's a threat in Britain. Is, and is, I mean, is this serious? No, this is, this is all serious stuff. I've, I've been researching this stuff for decades. And, uh, you know, now the neoconservatives, the people who wrote, you know, this is, this is a typical um, green peril script. Yes. A neoconservative script. Uh, and they've now imported those ideas into an internal threat. The Muslims internally are uh, taking over, they're a threat, their values are alien, and um, they have the wrong ideas. And what we have to do now is to 
tame those ideas, criminalize those ideas, stop the Muslims from thinking about freedom, about liberation of the Muslim world, and to also um, basically stop talking about Islam, and uh, to create a non-political version of Islam, yeah. which is submissive, which is subservient, which thinks like uh, the West, and ha you know, thinks the same things about foreign policy. So th this is the context. And actually, the whole thing, although Cameron sp had a number of themes, one of which was Muslims must stop having cons conspiracy theories, the Green Peril is actually a conspiracy theory. It's an international Islamist conspiracy theory. And this is what he's signed up to. And this is what uh, he and his advisors, whether it's Quilliam Foundation or Henry Jackson or the United States people, um, uh, they believe in this. They believe in a struggle with the world of Islam. And they are extremists themselves. They this are. is an extreme. Uh, and, you know, this is the irony that you could have, you take this script, you compare it to what's been said in the past by other politicians, there's no difference. And he actually says it. He's comparing it to, uh, you know, communist threat, to the fascist threat. But let's be clear. Look, this is nonsense. This is a conspiracy theory. There are no Muslim armies outside the shores of Europe. <laughs> yeah? Hitler and the communists, communists had a red army, Hitler had a, a mighty army as well. The Muslims have no armies facing the West. Yes, there are one or two people who commit so atrocities. Are you saying to me that these, <clears throat> these uh, fears are being organically produced? There, there's a whole ideology behind it. Yes. There's a whole extreme uh, uh, Christian right-wing ideology behind it, which is generating it. Blair was signed up to that. Yeah. Cameron was signed up to that. The Quilliam Foundation are signed up to that. Do you know th that's, that's exactly what they th believe? That's the thing. You know, they say that the, the biggest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince people he never existed. Yeah. And that's what we find with this too. Mm -hmm. It's this um, attack on Muslims is not, it, it's actually being driven by a very supremacist ideology that says we're better than these Muslims and and Muslims fighting back and demanding their freedom in the Muslim world is seen as a threat. And it's, and it's interesting because there's a line in Cameron's speech, he says, and like any extreme doc doctrine, it is subversive. I, at its furthest, it seeks to destroy, to invent its own barbaric realm, and it often backs violence to achieve this aim, mostly violence against fellow Muslims who don't subscribe to its sick world view. He could be talking about the neocons right there. Mm -hmm. Neocons act like that. They can justify what they've done in the Muslim world. It's, it's not, with all due respect, I'm not looking at it from an academic point of view. It's not a very well-written piece of work. No, it's not. Uh, it's, it seems like it's been done rather uh, in a hurry. But, no, the but, there's, but there's more to that though, yeah. rather than just not being um, a hurried piece of work, it's, it's woolly because the government, see the thing is they keep delaying when they're going to launch their strategy mm -hmm. on extremism and the reason is because their language is so poor and they can't explain what they're doing that they have to keep saying, oh we'll give it in the autumn. Uh, we'll do it later, mm -hmm. etc. Because if you heard Theresa May, the Home Secretary, she could not explain. She couldn't explain. But also, it's the whole thing, which is yeah. what is non-violent extremist speech? Mm -hmm. What what are these things? What are British values? Can you explain? And how do they differ from other people's values? What makes them British mm -hmm. in their way? And the whole thing, they can't explain it. Mm -hmm. And because they can't explain it, that's why this thing is so rubbish. Mm -hmm. And but also why it's so dangerous, because the woolly language means you can take any Muslim and say, well, according to this speech you're an Islamist or you're a non-violent extremist and on that basis we need to stop you. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of such a woolly speech. So yeah, it's very poorly done but it's dangerous for it's, that reason. It's extremely dangerous but you know, y y with all due respect, you yourself belong to an organization called Impact. Yes, yeah. And you were mentioned, your, not you but your organization was mm -hmm. actually mentioned by name. Yes. What, you're dangerous basically, <laughs> yes. aren't you? Yeah. And, I'll, and see, I've been thinking about this because the, the question, what David Cameron, his words when he mentioned MPAC, is in the Q&A element of his speech. Mm -hmm. And what he does, he says that um, there are uh, Muslims who set up organizations uh, purporting to represent the Muslim community when actually they don't. And, and he goes on to say some more and he says, so don't listen to the Public Affairs Committee, etc. And he mentions us by name. And I was sitting down, I was talking to Asko, uh, uh, other me founding member of MPAC, who were talking about this. I saying, why are we such a threat to the government? And the reason is actually quite simple. 
One is our staunch stance on Israel. We're uncompromising on that stance. We're, we're vehemently anti-Zionist and I, I have no love loss there at all. That's the first thing. Secondly is this, we talk about Islamophobia constantly in this country and we don't let it move off the agenda. And what we're doing, and this is you starting to see other Muslims clock onto this, is that we're linking it to the ideology that many politicians and journalists and people like Douglas Murray from organizations hold on to because there's a link. If, a, if a, like Dylan Roof, for example, in America, who killed those people, he believes in a white supremacist ideology and, and his, his work is justified by Islamophobes like um, Douglas Murray. Now, he may not directly say, go pull the trigger, but he creates the environment for the trigger to be pulled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a non-violent extremist, I think I'd say. Yeah. But um, also, we talk about our country's unjust foreign policy and that is dangerous. Don't take it personally, Rosa, because this is actually not about MPAC. Yeah. Uh, you see, he goes on to explain in his speech... <laughs> At, 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 the, at, at the root of this, he's saying that the violence in the Muslim world is not as a, a result of a legitimate process yeah. of change or conditions... Or because we're bombing world, them. <laughs> or because the West intervenes and props up certain dictators and then intervenes militarily with the most lethal killing uh, machines that we've ever come across. In history. In yeah. history. He's saying that's not the cause of it. No. The cause of it is an ideology and people who uh, actually analyze yeah. uh, foreign policy and say this, uh, that it's for foreign policy and it's the conditions. They are a problem. So groups like L MPAC L and others let me show you how that. Let me show you how stupid the speech is. Because when you start going through it line by line, you see just how idiotic it is. And I use that term just because it is idiotic. So he says in his speech, he says... Um, it begins and it must begin by understanding the threat we face and why we face it. What we are fighting um, is an ideology, it is an extreme doctrine. So that's he says that's the threat. Then later on he says we must be clear the root cause of the threat we face is the ideology. So, <laughs> hang on, so, that, well, so the problem we face is ideology and the ideology it comes from ideology. That I doesn't even mean anything. We're going to take this call. I found a lot of contradictions <laughs> when I read through the first time. I had to read a couple of times, actually, and I underlined quite a lot. But let's take this call. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Hello. Hello. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Welcome, assalam. You okay? Assalamu Yes, you have a question. You have a statement. Yes, sir. Yeah, basically, it's regarding the um, Cameron speech. Yes. Go ahead, you're yeah. live on community platform. Yeah, I'm going to speak to Raza. Sorry? Uh, I'm going to speak to Raza. Raza Nadine. Yeah, you're speaking yeah, sure, to sure him. Carry on. Uh, okay, basically, um, Cameron goes by on his speech. The rule of law exists because of the independent judiciary. Yes, I can hear you, yes. Yeah, so if rule of law exists because of independent judiciary, what about Kilka inquiry? That's taking uh, far too long for the results. Why doesn't he talk about his homegrown terrorist like Tony Blair? <laughs> he's, the, he's the same person that created extremism in the Middle East with Iraq. So before he started to uh, lecture Muslim communities in the UK, he needs to start looking at himself and his government and bring to uh, uh, justice the people that caused the massacres like Tony Blair. But see, you that's know? part of the problem, brother, because what I find is... It because I agree with you, Tony Blair yeah. is a war criminal. Mm -hmm. There's no hiding from mm -hmm. it. And he, you know when he yeah. says, God spoke to me that I need to go to Iraq. Yeah. That, that's, that's a bit crazy. You know, and that's, that's extremist Christian, in my opinion. That's what I'd call him. But the reality is that we don't talk about things in that manner in this country. So just today, there's a story about a 19-year-old from Newcastle who had yeah. been plotting to, to kill school children there. And he actually referenced Anders Breivik, the white Christian terrorist from Norway. And he referenced him and said, mm. that's part of the thing, you know, he's inspiring to me. And yet we don't call it a terrorist thing. Because the, the only terrorist threat we face in this country is from Muslims. Even though there was a report in America, and I don't move jumping to America, but they actually said since 9/11 we've had 48 attacks on Americans, um, uh, uh, 48 attacks um, and and people murdered because of um, white supremacist ideology, and 26 from uh, people that say that they're Muslim uh, terrorists. Now, so that means we've had more attacks from white supremacists, but we never talk about it. And in America, we had nine people gunned down, black people gunned down by a white terrorist. And again, we yeah. don't talk about it. And that's part of the thing, because it's, if you talk about other terrorist problems, you realize actually Muslims aren't the problem. And if anything, any Muslim reaction is because of 
our country's action. It's because of the fact we've occupied lands, we've killed them. And even if you don't believe what I have to say, fine. But believe the words of the terrorists themselves that committed these crimes. The guys who committed 7-7, what did they say? It's because of the Iraq war. They actually cite these things as a reason. <laughs> but we should, yeah. if, if uh, you know, Raza, you make an interesting point. Look, he says... This is about ideology. I d I'm sorry, just uh, I think uh, Zen, you're still online. Jazakallah khair, thank you for your contribution. Can I, I make one more uh, question? Sorry. One, thank one you more, so much. Salam alaikum. Uh, uh, so he's saying this is all about ideology. <laughs> and you know, violence uh, is not caused by an ideology. No, violence is a methodology, not an ideology. Mm. And you know, I make this point continuously. If the Palestinians were not Muslims, they would still be committing violence exactly. and resistance. In Lebanon, before the movements became Islamic, they were still uh, involved in violence. So, uh, violence has a cause. Now, hmm. let's, but let's use Cameron's theory, and it is a theory, there's nothing empirical about it. He says, we call these people Islamists and the ideology Islamist because they self-identify. Well, Tony Blair self-identified. Absolutely. The, right, the neocons self-identify as Christians. Mm. The English Defence League, yeah. the Britain First. They are white uh, Christians. That's how they see themselves. You know, the yeah. BNP. Yeah. You, do you know who was their uh, main architect and fundraiser? Mm -hmm. Jim Dowson. Yes. A Christian extremist. Mm -hmm. Look him up. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, when they go and take Bibles to Muslim areas, they're self-identifying as Christians. Mm -hmm. So why are you calling them far right? Mm -hmm. No, you're right, exactly, mm -hmm. they're not. You know, we shouldn't be calling them far right. This is Christian extremism. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and... Uh, Didn't Bush say something like that? Yeah, I was Bush told God. Well, he was there, you know, Bush and Blair were in, in, uh, you know, in a prayer this, session yeah. with God, and Blair said, I can justify this to my God. Uh, so all mm. these uh, uh, people have a extreme... Christian ideology, but he makes a point of it's the Muslims and the far right. Well, we know what the far right is. Brevik, mm. yeah, mm. Uh, and they are Oklahoma. Christians. You know the, the 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 people who committed Oklahoma. They are of another, not the neocon Christians, but of another type of Christian mm. extremists who believe that the Jews have occupied the American government. So one group says we have to deal with the Muslims first, and then yeah, the we, Jews, yeah. and the other group of extreme Christians says we have to deal with the Jews first, and then we'll come to the and, Muslims and, and, later. And, that's it. and they're driven by. And they're driven by their. <laughs> so by their he should apply that. Religion. Mm. And you know we can apply that to others. We can mm. apply it to Buddhists in other uh, places, Hin Hindus. But also with the ideology thing, it was fascinating on that other point is that it's. If ideology drives it, and what he means is, he's, you know, they say we talk about a, they mean like a Wahhabi Salafi ideology. Mm -hmm. That doesn't explain why you have Sufi Muslims in Chechnya fighting. The mm -hmm. Sufi Muslims. And, and in Syria. And yeah, exactly. Yes. It, it doesn't, ex it doesn't in fact, explain. the first people to, yes. were, were to go, were the, were the, uh, from to, the to declare jihad in Syria were the Sufis. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing, so what it's ideology is it? The ideology that drives these people is, one is, Islam says, um, fight against oppression. So the, I, the one thing guaranteed, that's what Islam says, but secondly, they want their freedom. And that's the thing. And you're right, even if the Palestinians weren't Muslims or the, anyone else, you know, the other people that are fighting for their freedom weren't Muslims, mm. they still use violence. Mm. And that isn't to blame them. It's because you've created a social condition mm. where a man feels that the only way that he can have his voice heard or have his freedom is to take up arms. Mm. Now that means that that man himself doesn't believe in taking up arms. Mm. And that's important. You know, it's the people that use violence, they don't use it as their first means. They are driven to that violence. And even our own security services speak about this on a regular basis that it's and, and the American general as well said that drone strikes create more terrorists than they kill. Yeah, I read that. Is the and and you know that if we're talking about violence and mm. ideology and an evil ideology then we need to look at uh, Europe's wars throughout history. Mm. They've only been free of violence for the last 50, 60 years. Even well, then. Even, but they're still going mm. in, in parts mm. of the world and committing violence. So what ideology is driving them? Mm. Mm. Yeah, but exactly. Throughout history. Well, maybe that's a. But that's the beauty of it, which yeah. is you never talk about them yeah, exactly. in terms of you, what you yeah. say is that's one individual, that's another individual, that's BNP, that's EDO, that's Douglas Murray, that's him, that's that government. No, no. Yeah. But we're not like that. Well, well, hang we're, on, we're, we're all the same apparently. Yeah. And when you, when people study Second World War, First World War, uh, this conflict, Spanish Civil War, what do they do? They look at the political causes. 
Mm. But when it comes to Muslims... It's religious ideology. Yeah, because this is a part of the crusading zeal that they've never been able to tame. Yes. And they've never been able to get rid of. And this speech is actually full of that crusading zeal and anti-Muslim rhetoric from the past. Just one example. It's exactly how they used to do it. Another thing to add more weight to what Jung is saying, uh, I can't say it better than he can, but just to add more evidence to it. There's a book written by a, a, a author called Matthew Carr, it's called Blood and Faith, talks about how um, Spain, how Muslims were treated in that part of the world and mm. how horrific it was. And it actually talks about how Christopher Columbus, who set off to find the Americas, what we're often told is it was to help look for new lands. Well, Actually, the book documents is part of the driving factor of Christopher Columbus going was to find more means to fight the Muslims at the time. Mm. And it's actually very well documented it's in Matthew Carr's book. Mm. And it's and this is historical thing. And it's you're right. It's that extremist mindset mm. still exists in so many people today. Mm -hmm. And it's and what and they're very clever. What they say is that killer, that shooter in America, mm. that's one lone nut job. They can't all be lone nut jobs. They're linked by an ideology, mm. but they don't want to talk about it because the more you talk about that white supremacist ideology, you start to realize, heck, there's many politicians that follow that same thing too. And, and, Maybe this, is, that, and that's this is not new as well. Just mm. f uh, it's fascinating that in 1857 mm. we had the first independence movement in India. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. And mm -hmm. they always call it the Indian Mutiny, <laughs> yes. you know. Mutiny, uh, as if, yeah. uh, but you know what they did with that, and they, they, their historians still to this day, they don't look at the fact that they were occupying and stealing yeah. the uh, wealth of another nation as the cause. What they say, if you look at all the uh, books, they exa say exactly what they're saying now. It was even though the leader of the movement, the Muslim leader. Um, there were uh, non-Muslim groups as well, was a Sufi. And they say, no, he went to Hajj and he, he met some Wahhabis there. So there, this is Wahhabi ideology mm. and this is their theory of jihad. Yeah. So this is their ideology. It can't be us killing so people and taking their land. It's not us. Yeah. Yeah, it can this never is, be us. This is a convenient get out that we are not responsible for anything we do in the world. And we, and it, it, the but reason, that's also part of the But aren't Muslims stuff. falling into the trap? I mean, I, yeah, I see. I agree. Yeah, are mostly the, not falling into the trap to actually, but when you talk about Sufism, they're the docile people, if I can use that language. They're the calm, cool, and collected. Well, they're not, 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 they're they never used to be. No, 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 but also, I don't know. Not all of them. I know what you mean, but right. the thing is, look at the Chechen Mujahideen. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So are we, uh, you know, we ourselves have not understood the problem. Yes. Have uh, we not, no, as because Muslims... Because the propaganda is so great, yes. and they've can managed to convince Muslims that the other Muslim is your greatest threat. But also, this is, is what but also this is where Muslims and Muslim groups, um, and I'd say many of our institutions like mosques, have failed. Mm. Because what they do is they don't give Muslims a counter-argument. So mm. imagine you're a young Muslim kid growing up, and all you see around you is Muslims being attacked in the media. So remember, mm. kids born after 9-11-7-7, mm. constantly attacked. Mm. Yeah, Islam being attacked, niqab, halal meat, all this stuff, mm. segregation, all, all that mm. stuff. Yeah, All these issues. And then what they do is they go to their local mosque, and they turn up on a Friday because most people don't only go to a mosque otherwise. And even then the khutbah is on an irrelevant topic, mm. yeah? not talking about the pressing issues they have at hand. And that kid doesn't have a counter argument. Mm. So what happens is the child now says, all right, these people are saying I'm bad and my religion is evil and, they've, and they keep showing me proof for it. Mm. Yeah? And then on the other side, they're saying Islam is peace, which isn't really countering what mm. the Islamophobes are saying. Mm. So the kid then goes, maybe we do have a problem in our faith. We have these bad Muslims that are causing a problem. Mm. And that's part of it. It causes an identity crisis. Mm. And you end up pointing the finger at yourself, saying there must be something bad about our religion. Mm. And even that term, moderate Muslim, it's such a dangerous loaded term. Yeah, I don't understand what that because means. Because if I said to you, I'm a moderate drinker, what that means is that I have to actively moderate my drinking. Mm. Because if I'm drinking too much, yeah. then it goes over the top. Yeah. So if someone is a moderate Muslim, what that means is that they are actively choosing to only follow elements of their faith. Mm. That's what they're saying, because if you follow it too much, then you become an Islamist. Mm. That is, and it's so, the term itself I find so racist. Mm. The, whole, the whole thing, which is that you've got some good Muslims, you've got some bad Muslims. Mm. You know, and, and even that point you mentioned, uh, you know, about how they find it's convenient for them to say, um, you know, we don't, um, you know, we don't cause extremism and terrorism. It's these people, they follow certain ideologies. That itself is a racist thing, and let me explain why. 
they think so hard. 30 seconds, we're moving towards a break. They think so highly of themselves mm -hmm. that they can't admit that their violence leads to a reaction. Mm -hmm. And part of that is convenience, they just want to lie. But part of it is a belief that we're superior, that we can't even be bad. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. And that, link, again, linked to the ideology. Yeah, and they did that in Africa and wherever they went. They yeah. were killing people, but they were making... And they're doing it to oh, this day. Oh, but now they just say that we're more they're, civilized. They're not civilized. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a very short break. Don't go away. Join me back within the next few seconds. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I thought we were... <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Community Platform. Just before break, of course, we are just, the topic is very much dissecting and discussing and also... Uh, trying to digest the Prime Minister's speech on Monday with reference to radicalization. Um, both my guests have been, uh, you know, quite vocal on the issues, both uh, uh, Raza and, of course, uh, Brother Jahangir. Uh, Jahangir Bhai, I just wanted to quote something from uh, his, uh, Prime Minister's speech. He's, he, earlier we said that he doesn't want certain kind of conversation taking place and here he says and as we debate these issues neither should we demonize people of particular backgrounds and yet the speech is full of contradictions because well, that's exactly what, what he does and and you know throughout his speech he's demonized the Muslims he goes into female genital mutilation he goes into segregated communities forced marriages you know oh, yeah. uh, Mm. And, you know, I used to do uh, anti-racism training very early on in my career. Mm. And this is the hallmark of a racist speech mm. of an anti-Muslim. Yeah. I'm not racist, racist. but... <laughs> you, 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 know what the, you know what the hallmark, when I used to do that training, mm. uh, people who were racist in the training sessions, mm. their arguments would be illogical and inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> uh, uh, to undo that, you actually expose the mm -hmm. uh, the I illogical and inconsistency mm -hmm. of the the argument. So he says we we shouldn't be uh, Muslims shouldn't be doing conspiracy theories. But then he talks about the Trojan hoax, mm -hmm. which is a conspiracy. Yeah, and been openly <laughs> MPs themselves have found it to say it's a conspiracy. Uh, then then yeah. there's another one. You know, he talks about Muslims are. Uh, in Bradford and Oldham are living segregated lives. Yeah, well, a lot of white people live in segregated yeah. lives. This is white the white flight. Yeah, this yeah. is how his, yeah. Hitler used to... This concept of ghettos, mm. you know, you don't hear about white ghettos. No, you don't. Uh, this concept of ghettos was invented in Nazi Germany, in mm -hmm. Warsaw, uh, and it was used for the Jews mm -hmm. because people used to live together in communities and they saw them as a threat with alien values, mm -hmm. and this is what he's doing. This mm -hmm. man is probably, okay. before he became a politician, talk, never even met a Muslim. Let's <laughs> talk to uh, Kaleem uh, Bulivand from Cage. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa So sorry to keep you waiting. Up. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. It's always a pleasure to hear um, Brother Jahangir. Yes, and, and of course you've uh, got Raza Nadim from MPAC. Um, Kaleem, your organization, Cage, was actually mentioned by name. You guys are you know, considered to be rather dangerous and we shouldn't really be talking to you. What was all that about then? Well, I mean, not to, to one-up your other guest, Reza, uh, but we were the only group mentioned in, in, in the speech. Um, mm -hmm. Reza got a, a name shout, but uh, he had to wait for the Q&A. Um, and the fact that he named our two groups, it says a lot, um, it says a lot about uh, the, uh, who's being effective in combating and standing up and fighting against the, the policies that uh, to, uh, the David Cameron, I was going to say Tony Blair. Um, they're so much one and one of the other now that it's hard to tell the difference. But the, the, the policies that David Cameron's bringing in, um, and who are trying to galvanise support from the Muslim community to be confident in our identity and, and to, to push back against policies which have no basis in academia, have no basis in um, in actually proof that they work, but are rather going to just uh, cause pain and hurt to our community. You know, your organization, of course, CAGE, mm. have been in the limelight for some years now. What are you doing? Have you um, responded to the Prime Minister's speech in any way? Well, we're looking at um, legal action to sue the Prime Minister for mm -hmm. defamation. Um, he called us extremists, which um, we feel is a slander on our character. 
um, as an organization, we call for equal justice for all. Now, he might consider that extreme, but it's only extreme if you're extremely idiotic. Um, and the fact of the matter is that uh, David Cameron and his government uh, are taking their lead from uh, people who uh, have no connection with the Muslim community. Um, and that's where they're, they're basing their ideas on, on what counts as extreme and what doesn't. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, we're also taking the, the Charity Commission to court today. We won our first hearing against them, um, and that was, a, that was a big win for us today. Um, and we've even uh, made a complaint to the UN uh, about the, the way in which the, the government and the Charity Commission are behaving. Just, just help me to understand, you are uh, in the process of taking uh, the um, Charity Commission to court? Yes. T today we had our first hearing yeah. um, in court uh, against the Charity Commission. Um, our lawyers were there, um, their lawyers were there, um, and we were arguing that they've been overstepping their bounds. Um, they're meant to be an independent, um, non-political uh, group to make sure that charities, um, that the money that you give to your charity is going where it's meant to go, and they're overstepping that bound. They're, we feel that they're becoming political. We feel that they're um, going outside of the, the bounds of the powers that they've been given. And the judge said that our argument had merit and that it was something that needed to go forward and, and be debated and argued in court. So that was a really big win for us, and we'll be, uh, we'll be taking it forward with the Charity Commission. Good. And that's why, that's why Cage are a threat, because they don't, when the, when the government attacks them, when they attack people like Kaleem and Muazzam, they don't take it laying down. And that's why they're such a problem. Because they don't allow the government to just say anything and establish it as fact. They challenge them. And that's what we need more Muslims doing. And I think it's partly, it's been quite criminal actually, I think, of the Muslim community that we've not done more to support CAGE when they've been attacked. Because it's happening on a regular basis. And what we can't do, we do it all the time as Muslims. What we say is, oh man, they were good guys. It's a shame what happened to them. Well, it's a shame because we didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's part of the problem. But you, you know, the, what, what, the, what uh, this bill is trying I've to I've still do. got Kaleem online. Okay, Kaleem, um, I'm very grateful. If there's any question that you want to pose to any of our uh, <laughs> two guys here, uh, go <laughs> ahead. If there's anything else that you think that you need to say, please go ahead. Um, we, the time well, is one of, one of the things that I'd like to, to, to say to, to you and to, to, to our guests and hopefully to the, to the Muslims watching, is, you know what, there, there's been quite a few attempts, and, and Reza sort of touched on it there, there have been quite a few attempts where the government thought that they could beat us down mm. and, and silence us. Um, and they tried to arrest uh, Moazem um, because they thought that if, if they took away the figurehead, um, Cage would collapse. Um, the case against Moazem was the only thing that collapsed. Um, mm -hmm. Cage came out stronger. Two days later, we were doing a, a, a march outside the Home Office with thousands of Muslims, um, saying, give us our Muazzam back. Yeah? Um, they, they've now tried to besmirch our name and attack us. Um, and we took them to court, and alhamdulillah, we've won the first round. You know, the Muslims, we need to stand up and fight. And when we do, and fight in the, <laughs> in, in the metaphorical sense of the word, but we need to stand up and fight. And when we do, inshallah, Allah will grant us the victories. Jazakallah khair for your time, Kaleem. Jazakallah khair, and we wish you well. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Really, the, 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 the cage seems to have been at the forefront of an well, front, it's, it's frontal a, it's attack. A, it's a highly appropriate name because if this counter-terrorism bill goes through, mm. counter-extremism bill, mm. Mm. we will all be in a cage. Yeah. Uh, you uh, will be caged dear. and you won't be able to speak. Uh, and, you know, uh, this is dangerous stuff. Broadcasters are going to be targeted. We Are you saying that I won't be allowed to do well, my program? Well, that's exactly what they're proposing. <laughs> orders, yeah, all you know, if stuff, you yeah, believe yeah. that Muslims have false grievances, mm -hmm. that there's no such thing as political causes, there's no, uh, you know, um, gen uh, wars going on and Muslims are not being killed and you as a Muslim don't feel injustice because that killing is going on, then you have to stop Muslims seeing that stuff. Yeah. No, yeah rather and than stop it, yeah. we're going to stop you seeing yeah, it or talking about it. And that's what they're going to do. I, I, and, you know, again, let me just, yeah. this is a beautiful yes. inconsistency. Yes. I, I, I love destroying racism and, uh, you know, uh, anti-Islamic hmm. hatred. So in, in one part of it, he says that, uh, you know, um, yeah, if they say, yes, I condemn terror, 
but the kuffar are inferior. Now, the, the, the word kuffar is misused by a lot of these neocons. Mm. You know, every, every re religion believes their religion is superior to the other. Mm. So mm. now they're taking the Muslims and saying, your belief that you, uh, you think Islam is better than other ways of life, which if you're a Muslim, you do. Mm. That's yeah. what a person would convert. Uh, right? So right? You, well. you are an extremist if you believe that. Yeah. Mm. But hang on. Every Christian believes that you only go to heaven if you believe in Jesus. Your salvation depends on you believing mm. that Jesus is the uh, Son of God and mm. through Jesus, mm. love of Jesus, uh, mm. you go to heaven. Now, is mm. that an extremist idea? Do they believe their way is superior? Well, See, this is how you destroy yeah. racism. Yeah. You expose. I would love to do a training session on your program. I was just going to say, <laughs> I was just going to say I, you that. Know, I thought... In, my, in the early part of my career, I'd come away from all that. Mm. It's but it's there. looking like now we're going to have to launch it's a new phase <laughs> where we have to, uh, you know, do anti-Muslim uh, training. I think that's a rather good idea. You might have just given and, and me a couple of Cameron, ideas. And we might start with Cameron, actually, because he hasn't realized it. But this is a typical... Well, this is important, oh, actually. But I think what you've just said is very important, that he has not realized no, it. because he's, and he's, I often wonder he's taking his script from others. But yes, also, no, he's also, taking script. This is important. I actually think you're right. This is, uh, all jokes aside, I think Cameron does need some anti-extremism training. And I'll tell you why. Because he says... Well, Anti-Muslim well, Yeah, exa exactly. But he, uh, no, but his wife, you know, I, he I, says in his a, speech, he says in his speech that only extremists divide Muslims into good Muslims and bad Muslims, then he talks about moderates and extremists. Now when he says moderate extremists, what he means is good Muslim, bad Muslim. So according to what he said, I think he's showing signs of radicalization. I think we need to look into that. Yeah. I, I can see this program being my final program. <laughs> I can just see that happening. But I, I was oh. laughing when I heard this speech. <laughs> the whole thing. This I, I, I thought I've been doing these debates with uh, people who have anti-Muslim attitudes, anti-black uh, uh, attitudes mm. for decades. And this man uh, doesn't realize he's repeated every kind of prejudicial argument mm. um, that there is the hallmark of that. Well, I'm, and, I, I'm interested in <laughs> And he's our helped, prime minister. Yeah, but who's <laughs> helped to write? I'm intrigued and I would be very interested if anybody can find out or uh, inform us who's actually helped to write this, uh, this speech because it's full of contradiction. I was, with, uh, I was at a conference a couple of days ago and somebody said to me about uh, uh, Islamic human rights. Why would you need Islamic human rights? Why would you need that? And I thought it was a relevant question. That I said, well, maybe it's because when policies are unjust, people don't feel happy, they need to go somewhere where they would get justice. And I'm just wondering whether many organizations that have been created for the purpose of cohesion are actually the cause of segregation in thinking. Well, you know, there is a problem. The Tories, particularly the right wing, have never accepted multiculturalism, although yes. they say they do. Yeah. He, Cameron uh, attacked it in uh, yes. Munich. Uh, you know, and it, yeah. and the whole Trojan hoax thing, mm. as well as being anti-Muslim, they are trying to roll back the frontiers of multiculturalism. So he talks about governors taking over. Well, I, you know, local authorities have been trying to encourage Muslim mm. governors for decades. Mm -hmm. He talks about entryism in Tower Hamlets. Mm -hmm. They've mm -hmm. been trying to encourage Muslims to get into the political system. Mm -hmm. So this is, these are symptomatic of prejudicial mm -hmm. attitudes yes. and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, the very fact that they've actually want to undo mm -hmm. uh, a, the, the whole concept of different faiths and communities living together and each being allowed to practice their own faith and culture. But, and instead they want to replace that by imposing something else on the, them, which they haven't actually worked out. There's yeah. another element to this as well, which is it's, it's covered in a book called Fear Incorporated 2.0, mm -hmm. written by a Muslim woman actually in America, but Yasmin Taib, her name mm -hmm. is, spelled mm -hmm. T-A-E-B, she spells mm -hmm. it. And in the book, they talk about the Islamophobia industry in America. And obviously, you can look at the parallels in the UK too. It's just we don't call it what it is. Mm -hmm. It's an industry. Mm -hmm. And what she says is that these attacks on Muslims mm -hmm happen for a very important reason and the reason is because you can't justify having drone strikes or occupation or military invasion if the other sides are human 
So you have to dehumanize them. So the attacks on Muslims here are directly linked to what our governments are doing abroad. Because there's the thing, how can you ever justify Guantanamo? How can you ever justify in, in South Waziristan killing a family that have gone to a wedding and killing them by a drone strike? You can never justify it because they're human beings. But if they are a threat to us and our values and what we believe in because we're so civilized, well then maybe some people, you have to break okay, some eggs. Okay, you have to break some eggs to make some omelets. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Jawed. Is it Brother Jawed from London? No, this is Muhammad Iqbal. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Brother Iqbal, Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum Assalam. Um, what I would like to say is this. I, I think, obviously, um, this terrorism issue is multi-causal. There are a number of causes in relation to all of these situations. And obviously, one of the major causes that the brothers have highlighted is foreign policy and hypocrisy and fallacious reasoning on the part of our Western governments. However, what I would like to ask and maybe reflect over with the panel and as a community is what kind of role can we as Muslims contribute? And I say contribute because this is multi-causal and aspects of this are from the Islamic, not Islamic faith, but Islamic community, i.e. certain interpretations that are fostered by Western appreciations in terms of, you know, jihadi mentality and so on and so forth. What do we actually contribute to this discussion apart from uh, you know, demonstrating hypocrisy and the fallacious nature of our government. Do we have a positive contribution? Do we have a counter-narrative? Or is our narrative reactive only? And just to demonstrate hypocrisy, because I don't see us really contributing to the debate, even though we don't necessarily have to, but as, you know, human beings, as Muslims, um, our religion has been taken and politicized by Westerners and certain Muslims. Do we have a contribution to make which is positive? Are people thinking about these contributions? It's easy to knock someone, and these people are fallacious in terms of their issues. We can knock them. But do we have anything to contribute as such? Um, hello? hello? Yeah, no, we can hear you. No, this is, go for yeah. it. But what I'm trying to say is this, this is the issue, because uh, my, my issue is this. Look, there is a jihadi mentality, and we need to get the ulama to demonstrate. And ulama are, in all fairness, in the Middle East and in many areas, a cogent case to be demonstrated that this jihadi mentality is overtly, you know, uh, not but Islamic they funded that, that mentality. Islamic mentality was defensive, not o offensive. And we need to do our role. But I don't think it's as significant as the government wants us to do it. But I think, nevertheless, we need to do something. And I want to know if our community, like MCB, MPAC over there, a Cage, we do really good, you know, adequacy work. But do we, are we doing a positive narrative as well? And are we contributing, coming together to give a positive narrative? Thank you so much. That's, Thank you. you know um, one of the mistakes that we make, I mean, first of all, we need to challenge the terms of the debate. Uh, and how but it's the, the wording. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, what we try to do also, which is not correct, since 9-11 uh, and probably longer, uh, all the security experts and even Muslims have fallen into this trap. They see what's happening into the, in the Muslim world and start to analyze it in theological terms. Yes. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is explain mm -hmm. what's happening in the Muslim world within a political context, a geopolitical context. Secondly, we are not the arbiters of everything that goes on in, in another part of the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. It's not for us to tell the people in Afghanistan or Syria how they, need, uh, how they uh, deal with their regimes mm -hmm. and how they bring political change. Mm -hmm. You know, don't become uh, you don't live there, you don't know the conditions, so don't mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. the spokesperson uh, as a British Muslim mm -hmm. for people all around the world. Mm -hmm. Those people are going through a process of political change, that will play out. What we have to do is, we have to say, how do we as Muslims in this country mm -hmm. best contribute uh, to that? Mm -hmm. And advise, give uh, good advice, you know, if but Mr Cameron wants to stop violence, let me tell him, don't go and try to change the whole concept of jihad. Mm -hmm. and, and, no, know, but also this, and, 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 and also mm -hmm. just, you know, Islam says, if you want to have that debate, Islam also mm -hmm. talks about your violence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it has an opinion on your violence. This, we, don't, we don't accept that either. And if you want to become a person who uh, stops violence, then lead the way. This, this you, yeah. you become the peacemaker, show us and, and help solve these problems in the Muslim world there's instead two, of causing There's two things to this. Right. Yes, sir. We're very short. I'm going to take this call. Sure. It's going to be very short. I'm sorry that uh, we've got a caller. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, 
Yes, we, I'm afraid we've only got literally 30 seconds, so go ahead, sir. Well, I just wanted to raise some points about what you're saying. I've only just turned on the programme, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm not able to contribute properly. But um, what I would uh, uh, suggest is that the narrative that we're speaking from is entirely flawed. Um, the reason we're even mentioning Islam or Islamization and jihadists and all these terms is because uh, we've been forced to do so in this country, but the actual narrative is that the geopolitical situation that arose in the Middle East are entirely responsible for um, you know, Muslims in that part of the world being involved in violence. So why can we not revise this whole um, you know, narrative that we can constantly talk about and, and actually pinpoint the exact problems which are geopolitical and have uh, you know, basically come about because of um, economic hardships in that particular region? Thank you very much. Jazakallah. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. I'm so sorry we're really running out of time, so I'm going to give you 15 seconds each for the last... Um sure thing. For Muslims, for us to have any impact, going back to Muhammad Iqbal's question, is mm. what the brother mentioned. Mm. For us to have impact, there's a couple of things. One thing is we need to stop apologizing. This is not our problem. We haven't caused terrorism. We're the victims of terrorism. Mm. And we need to have that mindset, be less apologetic. Mm. And secondly, if you want to change our condition in this country and around the world, Muslims that actually care and genuinely want to do something, like Kaleem said, if you have faith in God mm. and think we want to do something, mm. then organize. And organizing doesn't mean having an office and lots of people and lots of money. That's part of it. Mm. But what you need to do is say, sit down with people and say, how can we change our condition? And the second we ask that question, rather than say, I hope someone does it, when we do it ourselves, you see how our condition changes. Literally five seconds, because he's eaten into your time. Well, I think we need to take this whole extremism bill very seriously as a community. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, we will be silenced. Mm. We will not be allowed to speak. And uh, we will not be able to educate and inform people in this country Thank and you. deal with the conditions that we're talking about. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm so grateful for you, uh, you know, once again allowing us in your homes. Raza, thank you so much for thank coming you. such a long way. Jahangi Bai, as usual, Jazakallah Khair. Very grateful. Seriously think about it. What can we do within the law? We have to remain within the law. And yes, of course. But it's how do we educate ourselves. Mm. Jazakallah khair. Look after yourself. Join me again next week. Until then, look after yourself and your neighbor, whoever they may be. Assalamu alaikum. As